Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Shwetangoza. I am specialist solutions architect working with Amazon DynamoDB team. Later in this presentation, I'll be joined by my colleague Robert McCauley, who will share a demo on auto scaling and global tables. So today we'll talk about uh, Amazon DynamoDB no six, uh, NoSQL serverless scaling. We'll look at NoSQL way of thinking, uh, the serverless, serverless nature of DynamoDB and how it scales. And then we'll dive deeper into capacity modes and how DynamoDB adapts to your workload. And finally, we'll touch on global tables and uh, storage options. So let's get started. Uh, the Let's talk about what the NoSQL way is. So we all have been trained in SQL way of thinking. When building a database, first thing we do is come up with an entity model. Then we define relationship model followed by data normalization. Now normalization, as all of us know, is the technique of dividing the data into multiple tables to reduce data redundancy and inconsistency. Now, if you think about it as to why we followed this normalization process in first place, we'll quickly realize that we wanted to avoid data redundancy and save disk space. But in doing so, in turn, we depended on database servers to provide all the compute power in resolving our queries. Now, NoSQL is a way of thinking where you store the data as you want to retrieve it, by denormalizing your data. The denormalization is the technique of combining the data into a single table to make data retrieval faster. NoSQL way of thinking takes advantage of cheap disk space and save on compute and also provide higher throughput. Now, that is the NoSQL way. So NoSQL delivers on the promise of massive scale by using horizontal scaling where data and workload are partitioned over number of shards, which can grow as the data volume and throughput grows. Now, scaling is incremental, which means more nodes or partitions are added as needed. Typically, nodes are inexpensive, smaller commodity servers, and then scaling is nearly linear. Now, basic premises is the same for all NoSQL databases. If there is a way to share data and it is horizontally scalable. Now, when you think about SQL and NoSQL, the primary split when considering traditional RDMS, RDBMS and NoSQL, the question you need to ask is, is, are there any ad hoc queries? If yes, then building effective data model in NoSQL could sometimes be difficult. Now, and an OLTP workload is where 90 to 95% of access is a predefined pattern or set of predefined patterns. Now, what does an OLTP at scale really mean? So think about an example where you need to support a shopping cart or a session service for millions of users during a large scale online event or uh, messages sent by IoT devices or setting up uh, online gaming leaderboards. What does serverless mean? Premises of serverless is uh, customer developers want to build the code and need some, need, need some place to execute it. They want to let somebody else worry about underlying compute, storage, and scaling. Serverless gives customer a way to pay only for the services they consume and save cost on idle time. Some of you may already be familiar with serverless services like Amazon API Gateway, AWS Lambda, uh, and Amazon SNS. A lot of people who use DynamoDB do not realize that DynamoDB is the original serverless database. Now let's look at uh, what makes DynamoDB the serverless database. So think about uh, how you get started with the SQL database or a NoSQL database like Cassandra. 
First, you need sizing. Then you need to acquire and provision servers or nodes, install software and configuration, and so on. To get started with DynamoDB, all you have to do is create a table and start sending reads and writes to it. You don't have to worry about selecting the right hardware for your database or node or cluster. DynamoDB handles the hardware and resources behind the scenes. This is the core serverless nature of DynamoDB. DynamoDB data actually sits inside of what we call a table. A table is holder of all your data. A table is unique to an account ID and a region. Table name is a string literal. So you can call it accounts or you can call it a tracker, uh, whatever uh, your application or services that are gonna talk to it makes sense. Uh, now the actual data sits inside an item. Conceptually, it is similar to a row. It is an atomic unit of data. All operations on items are asset. Now, an item must have a partition key. A partition key is also known as a hash key. The partition key is important to find your data. Without partition key, we don't really know where your data is. Now, when you define the partition key, one thing you need to keep in mind is that it needs to be a high cardinality value. And we'll see why later in the slide. And so the partition key could be something either you derive like a session ID or a GUID for a user ID, or you can uh, define it within our application. As long as your application is able to provide DynamoDB with that partition key. Optionally, you can also have a sort key. A sort key allows for one-to-many relationship in DynamoDB. Now, the sort keys are often things like timestamp, version numbers, or audit log IDs. The sort keys are used to create grouping of data. Sort keys are used to sort data on the disk. Now, these sort keys actually open up a lot of query patterns where you can request a range of rows to be returned under a partition key using between statement on the sort key. When you have a table with a partition key and a sort key, the two are collectively your primary key. Combined together, the two uniquely identify a single row in DynamoDB. If you give DynamoDB a partition key and a sort key, we know precisely which row you are referring to. Now, once you create the table, let's look at what really is happening behind the scenes. DynamoDB horizontally shards a given table into one or more underlying virtual partitions. It enables us to scale to many partitions across many servers. Now, DynamoDB abstracts the virtual partitions so that you don't have to worry about them. You just use storage, read, and write capacity. And that's what you think about. This is the core of the serverless nature of DynamoDB. Now, as your data workload, which is data volume of read and write, change, DynamoDB transparently scales the resources incrementally to accommodate those changes. To the users, these resources are actually not servers, but they are just storage, read and write capacity. There are no servers for you to manage, configure, tune, or plan. Uh, DynamoDB is serverless and it exposes read and write capacity as tunable resources. Serverless does not mean that you don't manage servers. It means that servers are not even exposed to you in any way. In fact, with on-demand capacity mode, and we'll look at that uh, in next few slides, read and write capacity management is also fully automated and you simply pay for read and write requests you make. 
Now, here is an example of uh, performance at scale. So DynamoDB provides not only high throughput, but it also consistently and very predictable uh, responsiveness. So here is an example of lower latency at a higher load. Now, this seems counterintuitive, like for any database, four millisecond get latency to 2.5 millisecond average get latency, it performs equally well for reads and writes. Now, under the hood, here's what's happening. DynamoDB service is composed of many thousands of automated servers in two primary fleets. There's a front end, which is request routers, which are stateless and route incoming HTTPS requests to the appropriate node in the storage layer. On the back end, you have storage nodes, which are stateful and store every item. Uh, and each item that is written to DynamoDB replicated, gets replicated three times across three different availability zones. Now let's look at what on-demand capacity means. With on-demand ca capacity, and this is uh, the capacity you can set when you create the table, where you say, I want this uh, table to be an on-demand capacity. With on-demand capacity, there is no planning for capacity at all. You simply consume what you need with no throttling and pay only for those read and write requests. Now, for spiky and unpredictable workload, on demand table can scale much faster than auto scaling, which we'll look at in later slides. When you first create a table in an on demand mode, you start with a base throughput for that table. As we saw earlier, throughput scales up automatically as workload scales up. And we'll see how that underlying scaling works in next few slides. Now, here's a classic example of a spiky workload. As you can see, the writes in this particular example spikes to 1,500 to 4,000 for a very short duration of time. And then it goes to zero for long period of times. Now, this particular um, pattern can be observed where uh, you have devices that wake up at certain point and send ton of data. Now, in this particular case, as you see, you, there are periods of time where you actually have no traffic going into DynamoDB. So on demand would be ideal. You would not want to pay for the times you're not using DynamoDB. Now let's look at uh, what serverless adaptive capacity is, right? Customer often ask, how does on-demand capacity really work? So uneven access pattern is common to NoSQL databases. There are occasions where set of your data or key spaces get more reads and writes compared to key space in the same table. Now, other pattern, as we saw earlier, is, is that we see spiky workload experiences. And you have spikes in read or write during certain time of the day. For example, in the mornings or evenings for some fitness tracking application where everybody was, wants to go for a run in the morning or after office hours, you hit the gym. Now, th those are the patterns where you get traffic, but in the afternoon, for most part, you're not gonna get the same level of traffic. And you cannot control as to how, when that spike occurs. Now, to account for this, let's see how DynamoDB handles that. So, most NoSQL databases scale by adding servers to clusters that you manage. Now, in practice, this can be challenging. It turns out that at scale, provisioning servers and maintenance on NoSQL cluster is hard. The larger the scale, harder it is. That makes it hard to elastically change capacity 
which is important at scale. And some of my uh, audience here who actually work with Cassandra clusters may identify with what I'm talking about here. At Amazon, we learned this lesson with uh, Amazon's first NoSQL database implementation, Dynamo. That became a motivator to develop a NoSQL service which would be designed for incremental scaling. DynamoDB does horizontal scaling differently from other NoSQL databases. It scales in a smaller increment than servers and we call them partitions. This allows for incremental and efficient scaling in and out for the resources. Next, let's talk about adaptive capacity. So adaptive capacity is the feature that enables DynamoDB to run imbalanced workloads indefinitely. It minimizes throttling due to throughput exceptions. It also helps you reduce cost by enabling you to provision only the throughput capacity that you need. Adaptive capacity is enabled automatically for every DynamoDB table and that is at no cost to you. Partitions respond instantly in response to the change to the traffic. DynamoDB looks at what your table can do and not what a partition can do. So let's look at uh, first type of dynamic partitioning that occurs behind the scenes, uh, which is your storage growth partition, uh, partitioning. So the application here does most of its writes to a partition A, meaning that partition A storage is nearly full. Without requiring any input from you, DynamoDB automatically partitions A into two parts, partition A, which stays on server one, and partition B, which is placed on server two. This change is transparent to your application and DynamoDB automatically sends the request to the new partition. As more items will be added to the table, the partition splits continue. As your workload evolves, Dy DynamoDB automatically reshards and dynamically redistribute your partitions in response to changes in read throughput, write throughput, and storage. Next, we're going to talk about high traffic item isolation, where did you know that DynamoDB can handle imbalances in key spaces access on the fly, let's look at how this works. If your application drives disproportionate high traffic to one or more items, adaptive capacity rebalances your partitions such that frequently access items don't reside on the same partition. This isolation of frequently accessed item reduces likelihood of request throttling due to your workload exceeding throughput limit on a single partition. If your application drives consistent high traffic to a single item, adaptive capacity might rebalance your data such that a partition contains only that single item. In this case, DynamoDB can deliver throughputs up to the partition maximum of 3,000 read capacity units and 1,000 write capacity units to that single item, item's primary key. DynamoDB also boots throughputs on your existing partition. So it is not always uh, possible to distribute your read and write activ activity evenly. When data access is imbalanced, a hot partition can receive a higher volume of reads and writes compared to other partition. In extreme cases, throttling can occur if single partition receives more than 3,000 
RCUs and 1000 WCUs, a combination thereof. To better accommodate this, uneven access pattern, DynamoDB adaptive capacity enables your application to continue read and write to that hard partition without being throttled. Adaptive capacity works by automatically and instantly increasing throughput capacity for the partition that receives more traffic. Now let's look at provision capacity. We talked about on-demand capacity earlier. Now there is another capacity mode that customer can set at the table level and it is called provision mode. Let's understand better in context of on-demand mode. With provision mode, you set minimum consumption capacity, max consumption capacity, and a threshold of say 70%, which governs your max consumption. Auto scaling rules monitor your utilization of the table and scales similar to EC2 instance. Now with on-demand capacity, there is no planning for capacity at all. You simply consume what you need and no throttling at all. You pay only for those reads and write requests. For spiky and unpredictable workload, as I said, on-demand table can scale much faster than auto-scaling. So behind the scenes at the table level, capacity, when you provision capacity, it is managed at the table level. And the storage node level, uh, also has its capacity buckets. And these buckets, we call them token buckets for both level. Now these token buckets are refilled each second. And if the bucket is depleted and the burst bucket is depleted, then the requests are throttled or rate limited. Now requests are admitted by request router if there are tokens in the bucket for the table, either in table or burst bucket then requests are then sent to the actual storage node, which will serve the request if there are tokens in that storage node's token bucket. The table level bucket is proportionate to the provisioned capacity of your table. Adaptive capacity ensures that storage node bucket are always 3000 RCUs or 1000 WCUs. This allows the full throughput of each partition to be used as long as the table level capacity is not exceeded. Now, when you are on demand mode, you don't have to worry about uh, what you have provision for the table. Now, here's an example how, of how auto scaling mode works, right? So here you actually have a blue line. So your um, orange line here actually represents your uh, read and write throughput that are being sent to DynamoDB. Now with auto scaling enabled, DynamoDB recognizes that uh, your uh, throughput for read and write is constantly changing. And then that capacity at table level gets automatically managed for you. Here you see, it increases as your uh, uh, application throughput increases. And then when it sees the traffic dying down, the capacity uh, provision capacity actually falls lower as well. And that allows you to just use what you, your application need and that is what you pay for. Now, let's look at how auto scaling works here. So when your table, gets consumption, right? It That utilization matrix actually gets sent to the CloudWatch. Now with CloudWatch, when it recognizes that a threshold is breached at certain point in time, it will trigger auto scaling. And then auto scaling in turn updates your table capacity uh, based on whatever threshold you have set. Now this entire process can actually take up to eight minutes sometimes. So when you actually have a spiky workload and if you choose to use the auto scaling, uh, it may not really help your workload where it's a spiky, where you just go from zero to 5,000 as we saw in the case of on-demand. 
you might want to choose on demand capacity now here are the considerations again one more time is to when choosing capacity modes you can switch between read and write capacity once every 24 hours for even more savings customer can purchase reserved capacity for additional savings customer can save up to 50 percent over the cost of provisioned capacity when they purchase reserved capacity now reserved capacity purchase is typically non-refundable which means use it or lose it reserved capacity is not applicable to on-demand mode or global tables replicated write units and we'll see some examples of reserved capacity in next few slides so let's think about what's really happening uh, behind the scenes for uh, provision mode capacity right you actually have to plan your capacity and that is very important so understand how much capacity you need especially if you have an upcoming event now one read capacity unit represents one strongly consistent read per second or two eventually consistent read per second for an item up to four kilobyte in size now one write capacity unit represents represents one write per second for an item up to one kilobyte in size a single partition in dynamo db table can handle 3000 reads and 1000 writes per second so the question then becomes is is that how DynamoDB can handle millions of requests per second on a table? Well, the answer is the service allocates that many partitions on your table so that it can handle millions of requests per second. As a simple arithmetic, if the table needs 2,000 writes per second, it will need two partitions. Now, let's say you have an upcoming event that you know and you need to handle say 80,000 writes per second at peak to handle the peak load switch to provision mode and allocate 80,000 WCUs to your table prior to the event and then you can switch back to your or original configuration now the advantage of doing this exercise is is that now your table is ready to handle your peak traffic without repartitioning of data Allocating 80,000 WCUs will very will be very quick next time, and if you use on-demand mode, it will be instant. Now, when I talk to customers, I often get questions: Is is that does DynamoDB support three capacity modes, on-demand, provision, and reserved capacity? Well, answer is no. Reserved capacity is a mechanism by which customers can reserve DynamoDB capacity for one year or three year period. Reserved capacity is only applicable to provisioned capacity. Reserved capacity is applied to organization's billing account and serve as a base for any provisioned capacity consumption for all your organization's account. Now, let's apply this to uh, one of the charts that we saw earlier for um, provisioned capacity. So here is a provision capacity. And uh, now, if there is certain cost for your provision capacity per each read and write uh, that you purchase, uh, at right, that is uh, so provision, provisioned per hour basis, right? So in that particular case, uh, say if you were to purchase uh, reserved capacity represented here in green here what's happening is is that you purchased uh, uh, 20,000 reserved uh, reads for a given workload then you pay 20,000 up front for pay for 20,000 read capacity units up front and then whatever else that is not covered by your reserved capacity you end up paying at a normal charge and typically you would want to establish the baseline for all your tables when you come up with uh, reserved capacity calculations now if you want to be a uh, little bit more aggressive you can say you know 
based on my historic consumption, I want to pay, uh, save a little bit more and go up to half of my typical consumption in reserved form. And that's a valid point. Uh, but do keep in mind that uh, once you reserve the capacity, those are use it or lose it. Now, here's the most aggressive form, right? And if you purchase more reserved capacity than you can consume, that is not typically recommended because now if you look at the green area on this chart, the periods of time that you are not consuming that capacity, but you are still paying for it. Next, I want to quickly touch upon global tables. Now, based on serverless nature uh, of uh, DynamoDB, global tables are serverless too, right? So uh, these global tables are built on DynamoDB's global footprint to provide you with fully managed multi-region and multi-leader database that provides fast local read and writes for massively scaled global applications. Now, these global tables replicate your DynamoDB tables automatically across choice of your AWS regions. Global tables eliminate the difficult work of replicating data between regions and resolving update conflicts, which enables you to focus on applications business logic. So let's look at how uh, uh, these um, multi, uh, multi-active replication works. So global tables actually monitors changes to your DynamoDB item data, and it automatically replicates those changes to the remote regions in just seconds. Now, DynamoDB table knows when a write is a replicated write versus a direct write, which says a write made by a global table service it won't try to replicate it again to the remote region. So that way you avoid circular rights. Now, global tables goal is to get the same copy of an item in every table worldwide. There are many replication flows running at the same time in global table version two. So if you have not upgraded to global table version two, Recommendation here is please go upgrade to global table version two. In fact, uh, one replication pipeline is set up from each source region to each remote region so that in the event of failure in a remote region, only replication to that region is impacted while other replicas continue to replicate normally. Now, third component of the serverless the nature of DynamoDB is, is that customer actually pay for storage as well. So till now, uh, till last, uh, re last year's reInvent, uh, there was only one storage mode available. So let's consider the use case here. Uh, to understand the data lifecycle. Let's say you launched your e-commerce platform. You start with DynamoDB standard table. You start getting more and more orders. However, as expected, older orders are less frequently accessed, but you still need to keep them to offer your customers the ability to view these orders quickly. Now, your throughput cost is growing at a steady state as you are gaining new customers, but your storage cost is growing much faster as you need to keep older orders data in table as well. You need to allow your returning customer immediate access to these older tables. Now, at a given point in time, and it may not be applicable to all tables you have, but at point in time, as your data storage grows, storage would become your dominant cost and your total cost increase is primarily driven by storage. And then you would end up paying more for higher throughput storage than your application requires. Now, some customers actually use TTL and uh, DynamoDB streams 
to keep the storage cost low by moving all data to S3. Now, as I said, last year at reInvent, we announced um, uh, two second table class. Now we offer two table classes, DynamoDB standard table class and uh, DynamoDB standard infrequent access table class. DynamoDB standard infrequent access class, you can allows you to optimize the cost of your DynamoDB storage for your e-commerce platform uh, we discussed earlier by storing new recent orders in DynamoDB standard table class and then older infrequently access orders into standard infrequent access table class. So for the specific tables where majority of your data is infrequently accessed and storage is dominant cost, you can switch to DynamoDB standard IA and start saving tot on total cost. With that, I wanna hand uh, the reins over to uh, my colleague, uh, Robert McCauley. Robert, take it away. All right, thank you, Oza. Hello, everyone. My name is Rob McCauley. I'm a specialist solutions architect focusing just on NoSQL and DynamoDB. I joined Amazon about 10 years ago as a relational developer. And over the years, I discovered DynamoDB. And what I like most about it is how serverless it is and how easy it is for a developer like me to get set up and running. There's really no worrying about servers, server sizing, storage, CPUs, memory, networking. You simply create a new empty table and start reading and writing to it. And if you want to do replication, that's easy as well. So I want to show you a demo now of how to set up Global Tables replication, our multi-region replication. You can try this yourself. If you just search for Global Tables Tutorial, you should get to our documentation page here that has a really simple walkthrough of how to set up a table and then make it into a global table by adding a replica. You can try this in a console if you like, but I'm going to use the AWS command line interface, the CLI here. So the steps are simple. First, we'll create a normal table in the Ohio region, US East 2, called music. I'm going to request that from the command line interface. There it is. Status is creating. And also, I'm using streams. DynamoDB streams is the uh, optional feature whereby you can detect changes to your table in near real time. You can do this yourself. And it's also required for global tables to uh, find changes to any one table so that it can move them across to the other tables. Now, at this point, I could do a describe table to see the status of the table, but I've simplified that to status.sh script that'll look for that music table in any region, US East 2 here. Let's see. Status is active, great, but no replicas yet. All right, so we're up and running with a regular table. At this point, now we simply ask that same table to create a replica of itself somewhere else, US East 1. Let's go ahead and do that. So update table, add a new region. Let's check the status now. OK, so now we check and we see that there is a replica. And the replica is online and active, so we're done. The global table is ready to go. We could write to either US East 1 or US East 2 and know that the changes will be replicated in typically about one to two seconds. But the tutorial has us go further. We can continue. We can create another replica in a different region and have a three node global table. Let's do that. I think I want to put a copy in Ireland. And that region is EU West 1. So we'll go out to that region, create a table, and create all the linkages behind the scenes to keep them replicating in, in sync with each other. Let's do a describe table on the original table and see if the replica is in the list. Not yet. Let's go ahead and try it again.
Okay, status is active on all three nodes. Excellent. So we have an even more powerful global table at this point. So let's give it a test. Let's see if we write to the original table, it should pretty quickly replicate the other regions. So you can follow the tutorial. You can have it put in an, one item in the music table. But for fun, I prepared five items here, which we can use. I'm going to copy that and put that into our original table, five put items. And at the same time, let's go and see if we can see that in our table and our, especially our replica tables. I'm going to jump straight to the East 1 region, see if I'm quick enough to catch the replication. There's our music table. Let's explore table items. And it's running a scan, and there they are. There's all five items for us. Excellent. So if you're wondering how quickly the replication happens, we measure that on your behalf through a CloudWatch stat called replication latency. And you can see that yourself. Let's go ahead, let's go back to our original table and look at the table details. And then we can click on monitoring here. And this is the DynamoDB console, but it's got a bunch of interesting CloudWatch charts that it'll embed and display for us, including the replication latency. We have to scroll down a little to get to that one. All right, here we go, global tables. Okay, so what I'd like to do is jump, at this point I can jump actually straight into CloudWatch and view this in the metrics in CloudWatch. And it'll prepare a chart. I think there's an initialization for this chart with some dots and lines. And over time, it'll make more sense. But what you can do to start off with is to request the number, as you see here. When we click number, we should get a summary. And there we go. So it's measuring relative to US East 2, Ohio. <clears throat> What's the latency to go to blue? The US East 1 is about 500 milliseconds. And EU West 1 is 800 milliseconds. So pretty good latency. And you can plot that over time to see if that's changing. But it's good to know that the replication is quick. And some benefits for you as a customer is with global tables running, you have even more availability. We advertise four nines of availability by default. But with global tables, now you have five nines, 99.999% availability, uh, because you really have two regions. Each region has three copies of your data. So your data is very, very available in the case of a regional outage or a zone outage, for example. OK, for our next demo, let's take a look at scaling DynamoDB and making the decision between on-demand capacity mode and provision capacity with auto scaling. What I have here is an Excel model, it's a financial model showing what the cost and behavior of a DynamoDB table might be given certain conditions and requirements. So we can see the orange line here is the level of traffic being sent to our table. It's pretty low, about 200 requests per second. And we can assume we're in on-demand mode, so it's being able to be handled without any levels or decisions to be made. Now, on top of this, we want to handle a batch job. We want to maybe load in 3 million records at time zero. So we can simulate that. This is a live model. There's 3 million records. And it causes a big spike right at time zero. Let's say this is midnight. And raises the traffic level up at a rate of around 2,200 requests per second. And it lasts for almost an hour. And then it drops back down. So this is what we'd like our DynamoDB table to be able to handle. And it certainly could handle that in on-demand mode. Question is, can we handle it in provision capacity? The best way to do this is to have the developer warn us 10 minutes before, or just have them directly alter the table to lift the capacity up to about 2,500. And then they can drop it back down again immediately and be very efficient with the provision capacity. <clears throat> this isn't always possible. This job may be coming from an external party, and we don't have that kind of coordination with them. Let's see what might happen. If we had provision capacity 
with a low level and auto scaling, here's how the simulation would show that. So the blue line is your provision capacity level. It's at 500 to start handling that tra traffic level, but it takes a few minutes to react. So it takes two minutes to detect a change in traffic, and then maybe another five minutes or so to affect the change and to lift the capacity level on your table. And so it's not instant. And you do have this period here, this gap in between where you uh, have a strong risk of throttling. Some of these requests may actually succeed because of our burst capacity and retries, but we want to avoid this scenario in general. So what we could do is we could perhaps talk to the developer and get them to just start a little bit slower, maybe not so abrupt, right? If we look at this orange line, it's really rising very quickly. It's sudden and it's overwhelming to provision capacity, which is much slower to react. So if we just control our batch job to make it start at a slower rate and then go faster and faster, look what happens. The provision capacity with auto scaling is a little bit better at keeping up with that traffic. Let's give it a 10 minute ramp. So start very slow and just get a little bit faster each minute. And sure enough, that is all we needed to let auto scaling react in time. And we're covered all the capacity. This little bump will probably be covered by burst but it looks like a pretty good solution. So you can also derive the cost of these, you know, on demand, this would have been $8, but with this auto scaled provision working, it's you know, about $2. So it's probably a good move to move this table to provision capacity if you can handle these uh, you know, spikes and avoid them uh, through techniques like this. If you wanna play with this Excel model yourself, you can do so. Here's a link, bit.ly slash DDB cost. Uh, there's a whole write-up on there. There's some exercises you can try, and there's another Excel model as well showing the decision about whether or not to create a GSI, Global Secondary Index. And that wraps up our talk for today. Thank you for coming. This deep dive into the NoSQL serverless scaling of Amazon DynamoDB. We'll see you next time.